Hello and welcome to another episode of the Duct Tape Marketing Podcast. This is John Chance and my guest today is Josh Burnoff. He's a best-selling author or ghostwriter of eight business books. He's contributed to 50 book projects that have generated over $20 million for their authors. He's formerly Senior Vice President of Idea Development at Forrester, where he spent 20 years analyzing technology and business. We're going to talk about his most recent book, Build a Better Business Book, How to Plan, Write, and Promote a Book That Matters. So, Josh, welcome to the show. It's great to be on. Good to talk to you. So, I'll just throw out like one really big question to start us off, um, okay. and then we'll hone in on uh, things. You know, what, what are the essential elements that a business book needs to be good? How is that for well, a, how is that for a big question? <laughs> no, that's exactly the right big question. And uh, I'd say there are two things: one that everybody understands, and one that people don't understand. Uh, the thing that everybody knows you need is an idea. Yeah. That is, you need something that will solve a problem for a specific group of people, and it has to be a differentiated idea. That is, an idea that hasn't been heard before. So that's what people know. What people don't recognize is that business books are made out of stories, hmm. stories about people, stories about business people, uh, about ordinary consumers, about people who have a problem, and you get insight from the way they solve that problem. And unless you've collected those stories and shared them in an interesting way, your book's going to be boring and it's not going to sell. Can a business book, like, I mean, uh, a fiction book, you know, has a narrative and a plot and characters and we get to the end, hopefully, and go, oh, that was amazing. Can a business book have a narrative similar to that or is it there just to do some nuts and bolts work? Uh, it has to have a narrative similar to that. Now, we understand this if you're reading a business book that's, say, a description of uh, Elon Musk's life or, right. uh, you know, how the Netflix was created as a company. But when you're talking about a business book that solves a problem, there's a natural order to it. In the first chapter, we have to scare the crap out of you by getting you to see that <laughs> there's a either a problem that you're going to have if you don't follow the book or some opportunity you're going to miss out on. That's the fear and greed options. Yeah, and yeah. then after that, we describe the, the parts of the solution. We show you how to implement that. We might show you some more detail about how it applies in different situations. This is a natural progression from you have a problem to the solution to the problem to the details of the solution. And that's just as much a narrative as if, narrative as if you were reading a novel. All right, let's, um, some people learn better from the negative. Um, let's talk about some business books that are terrible. Um, <laughs> what is, without naming names, um, what, uh, uh, what do they get wrong uh, typically? So I don't know if your listeners have had this experience. I have many times of the business book where you read chapter two and you're like, gee, that sounds just like chapter one. And then you read <laughs> chapter four and you're like, oh my gosh, it's just the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So there's a word for what that book ought to be, which is a blog post. <laughs> <laughs> so if what you have is a blog post, write a blog post and you'll save us all a lot of trouble. Uh, ideas that are worth writing a book about have to be big. That is, they need to affect a lot of people. And they need to have consequences. They need to have elements to them. They need to have some subtlety to it that you need to figure out. And unless you have the ability to do that, you really should just write a blog post. <laughs> uh, there are two types of book, business books. I read lots and lots of business mm -hmm. books, um, as I know you have as well. There are two types of business books I really like. Some, some kind of stay in the big idea category. Mm -hmm. um, Seth Godin's books, I think, are a great example of always a great idea that you that he clearly believes in and that you can believe in, but mm. not a whole lot of how-to uh, in them. And then there are the prescriptive books, which are probably closer to what I write, you know, which is literally a retelling of what I do, <laughs> you know, in, in a book. Um, are there different approaches that need to be taken for those two different kinds of books? And feel free to throw in, oh, no, there's four or five other categories yeah. too. <laughs> well, in, in the problem-solving kind of book, which is both of those are, the big idea books and the how-to books, are basically problem-solving kind of books. I think it's a mistake to think of them as two different kinds. They're really okay. two ends of a continuum. Yeah. Right. So, for example, the book I just wrote, right, Build a Better Business Book here, this is a how-to book. 
There's 24 chapters. There's a chapter on covers. There's a chapter on how to right. do research, right? These are all very specific things that you have to learn how to do. If you look at the first book I wrote with, with Charlene Lee, Groundswell, the posters yeah, behind yeah. me on the wall, yeah. that was a big idea book. And the big idea was that social media wasn't a toy anymore and people really need to learn how to take advantage of it. But even there, we had to say, okay, if you're going to use social media for research purposes, here are the steps involved in that. Or if you're going to use social media for marketing, here are the steps involved in that. And unless you have some kind of prescription, then all you're doing is basically throwing grenades and blowing things up. And while that can be entertaining, it's not that helpful to people. So, all right. So I'm, I'm going to go down the same path. There are two kinds of yeah. authors, I think. And, the, and, um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of times they fall into maybe business models or how they yeah. think about business models. There's obviously the Malcolm Gladwell giant big idea that's going to lead to giant big stages maybe yeah. um i wrote my first book don't tell my publisher this but i wrote my first book to really be a platform for selling product and and for you know bringing uh, a licensing program uh, to the world using that methodology and that was that was really the book was a piece you know as opposed to i in fact for many years i didn't even call myself an author necessarily mm. well if you wrote a book and you published it, you're an author. So please call yourself an author. But what people need, first of all, you're not Malcolm Gladwell. I'm not Malcolm Gladwell. Very few people are Malcolm Gladwell. In fact, I have a section in the first chapter of my book about why you're not Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> um, so for the rest of us, the success does not come from book sales, right? That might be a nice little source of income. You might even... Not suppose you reach a thousand people. Is that a failure? Yeah. Yeah. If those are the right thousand people, that could be an enormous success. So the question is, how will that benefit you? And of course, it should start by benefiting the people who read it. But then they're going to say, uh, "Hey, I should hire this guy," or "Oh, this company is worth looking at," or "This is a different way to look at the world. What vendors can help with it?" Oh, look, he's got uh, one of those vendors he's associated with. So. There are lots of ways that that you can benefit. I I guess the simplest way to put it is a book is the largest possible lump of content marketing. Yeah, yeah. And just like any other content marketing, it attracts attention by being useful and then it translates into some sort of business for the author. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I you know f f fortunately uh, out of some sort of dumb luck, um, I actually sold a lot of copies of Duct Tape Marketing as well, as well as it being my kind of launching for a platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, it kind of lucked into the best of both worlds, I guess. Let's talk about book proposals for a minute, you know, which is a typical organ that a lot of people would use to uh, get a publisher interested in a book. Boy, that has changed in the last uh, 20 yeah. years uh, or, or so. Um, do, peop do publishers care about ideas or do they care about platform um, or do you have to have both? Well, you have to have both, but platform's more important. And that's a shocking thing to say. Right. But the in the last 20, <laughs> last 20 or 30 years, what I have seen is that uh, some publishers like Wiley explicitly say, you have to prove to us that you can sell 10 or 20,000 books on your own. And the other publishers don't say it quite so starkly, but they believe the same thing. Yeah. Um, and that means, and they're not going to help you very much with the selling. You have to provide that yourself. So you need to have a podcast or a blog or a regular appearance on CNN or a Forbes, you know, column or whatever. You need to have some sort of a platform to mm -hmm. roll the book out. Now, a person with a large platform and no ideas isn't really very interesting to publishers because someone has to get something out of the book. But the, they look at the platform first and the ideas second. Sadly, it's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I think it's become more true, quite frankly. Um, you know, Definitely. you mentioned Wiley, for example. I've even seen some some authors uh, talk about, you know, they had to guarantee uh, that they were going to sell that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it's X number. Um, so, well, yeah. They, they, I, I can't resist pointing out here that there are alternatives now. Sure. The, well, there that's, are hybrid the, publishers. Another thing that's really changed, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can pay a hybrid publisher to publish your book. I'm this most recent book I did with a hybrid publisher, and I'm not saying that's the only model. My previous book was done with a traditional publisher, yeah. and yeah. you can even self-publish books on your own uh, through uh, the Amazon platform. And of course, yeah. that makes much less of an impact. But if you really got to get your book out, 
you don't need to go through a traditional publisher anymore. Well, and I, I, I have a few, um, you know, folks in the, the, that I know well that made a whole lot more money on their book by doing self-publishing yeah. because it sold really well and they kept 80%. Uh, Phil Jones. Phil Jones <laughs> right. is one, the first okay, one that came no, to mind. No. It's, but it is, hard, it is hard to make your book catch fire yeah, if yeah, you're yeah. doing it, you're publishing yeah. it independently like that. Yeah. The, the traditional publishers have a certain amount of clout and distribution and the hybrid publishers are helpful in that, in that vein yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so my books are not heavily researched in the, you know, the idea that we had 3000 participants in some sort of study. I mean, yeah. my books are really kind of more, here's my daily knowledge. I mean, here's what I've learned working with X clients. Um, is there, again, I don't think there's a better approach, but they're yeah. quite different, aren't they? I, uh, you know, what you need something that proves that your book is right. Yeah. And I was sitting down and I thought of these ideas and I wrote them down as not sufficient. <laughs> it um, might work. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, everyone does secondary research. This is basically going on the internet and finding uh, quotes and studies right. yeah. and stuff. But you need some sort of primary research. But what you said, the, the you know, the uh, survey kind of research or data. Look, I worked at Forrester. I actually created the program that they used to collect consumer data that was wonderful to have all of that data yeah but you can write a book that's based on anecdotes um and if you're telling the stories of you know sarah that that changed her marketing program or or alvin who figured out a better way to uh to track attribution those stories are quite sufficient as primary research you don't necessarily need a huge amount of data yeah um I guess case studies would fall into that too. I mean, I, I know people love to see, oh, I'm a business kind of like that. And they did that. Oh, okay. That will work for me. Case studies are essential. In fact, I would say when I work with authors and we're like at the beginning of the book process, the lack of case studies is the biggest problem that they have. So yeah. you want to be thinking right at the beginning, where am I going to get the stories I'm going to tell? Where am I going to find these interviews? If a book is, is uh, let's say, 14 chapters long, it should have 14 case studies in it. So, so you might even organize the book around what you got. Is, uh, are you saying that? Well, uh, one way to organize the book is to start every chapter with a story. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's actually pretty common to do that. In it fact, is, they're, right. no, they're known as Malcolms after Malcolm Gladwell, <laughs> right, <laughs> who's, who's like the master of this. Um, and... People love that because they read it and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm having the same kind of problem that she had. Or, right. oh, man, yeah. he's he found an interesting way to solve that. I'm going to learn from that. And I'll tell you something. Once you tell one of those stories at the beginning of a chapter, whatever you say in the next three sentences after that, people will believe no matter what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you you have, um, as I noted in your intro, uh, been a ghostwriter on some projects. Um, mm -hmm. What are some reasons somebody who has a good idea might use a, a ghostwriter? Well, it's always a question of time. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. also a question of talent. Some people just don't feel like they're good writers. Yeah, but mostly it's people who could write but just don't have the time to do it. And in the cases where I have uh, ghost written books, um, and I've done three now, they're all situations where they were senior executives, right. very busy people. They had really interesting ideas and uh, sometimes a lot of detail behind it, but they just wanted to hire somebody who would assemble that into a, a useful book. And what you read there was, was written on spec based on what the author, the person whose name on the cover asked for. Um, they just outsourced the writing just like you might outsource the graphics or, yeah. or uh, you know, a, a survey that you did. Let's talk about editors. Um, <laughs> The, the, I think the common belief was that an editor was going to make your book better, you know, certainly help you devise or, or get your ideas down. And I'm not talking about copy editing, but, you know, kind of big picture editing. It feels like, um, and this is coming from my experience, uh, that, you know, the editor's role has been to acquire a book and that's about it. Um, and well, that, that input, you know, in a business book, they're not qualified to really give much input. It's a question of how busy the people at these publishing houses are so i there's a quote in my book from hollis heimbach who's a, a very well-known editor at harvard business 
mm-hmm. who says, look, we expect the manuscript to come in ready to publish. Yeah. Um, so they don't really have the resources to edit your book. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you don't need an editor. Most people who work on a good book will hire a developmental editor. And that's someone whose job is to, to do the work of helping you with the ideas, the sequence, the structure, the language, how the chapters are assembled, everything, just so that you have a high quality piece of work that's publishable. Yeah. This is going to be a hard question to have a definitive answer, but I'm certain you have an opinion on it. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what role does the design of the interior pages as well as the cover play in the success of a book? Well, uh, let me divide those two. Yeah. Okay. Um, unless your book has got some sort of unusual elements to it, uh, like, you know, a lot of sidebars or something like that. The interior design usually just is utilitarian and it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, people need to tell when things are a heading or a subheading. Um, but, but it, most books are, are pretty much interchangeable from that perspective. I've seen the some cover, poor font. I've seen some poor font choices. Oh, 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 you you can definitely make a mistake there. If your book, if the the uh, the body text in your book is in sans serif, you're making a big mistake. That's a serious readability problem. I uh, um, I can't resist mentioning here too that that you know how do you tell when a book is poorly self published? It's the margins. It's always the margins that are screwed up. You look at the book and you're like, this doesn't look. Yes. So the margins are like the dead giveaway. But you mentioned the covers. The cover is important. It's just as you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go out and get married and just like grab a T-shirt off of the off of the, <laughs> the uh, you know, the hanger. You, this, you're putting your best face forward there and a striking cover design together with a title that connects with it can really make a book much more recognizable but things are sort of backwards people don't buy a book because it has a great cover they remember a book because it has a great cover and then that becomes an iconic representation of how great that book was they read it and then they associate that with the cover that they're looking at i I know myself i'm a you know, walking through a bookstore back when mm. we used to do that, um, back, we you know, a, face, that yeah. a facing out, you know, book that had a compelling cover. It, it was, it was a stopper, you know, it would be mm-hmm. like, huh, I want to at least take a deeper look at that. Well, nowadays people are looking at the book on a screen yeah, and it's, it's an inch tall. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the subtle little details of the design don't become obvious until the person has had it shipped to their house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very true. Let's talk about another thing that's become, I think, a must. Um, audio. Um, mm-hmm. If you're going to write a book, uh, count on doing audio or having audio done uh, today, I would guess, huh? Yes. Uh, audio, you cannot have a book that that's, has a full measure of success unless there's an audio book to go along with it. And yeah. people love to consume uh, business books on audio while they're exercising or commuting, you know, or on an airplane or whatever. So you really have to have that available to them. And in my book, I actually recommend that if the author has got any inclination at all, it's yeah. great if you, the author, can record the audiobook yeah. because yeah. then your voice and your, your willingness to communicate the things that are important to you will come across effectively. And even if you, know, you have a scratchy voice or a nasal voice or something, most people can do a good job with that. It's just yeah. that that's likely to take you 10 or 15 hours and not everybody's willing to put the time in to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and if your goal is to build a community, to build a business around a platform, a larger platform around, I know I find it all the time. People are like, Oh, now that I met you, you know, I can hear you in my head already, you know, because I listened to your book. Yeah. So it, it really is, uh, um, you know, it, I think it's a must for if you want to do other things with the book as well. Yeah. Okay, we have exactly um, uh, 30 seconds left. Let's talk about promotion um, <laughs> of the book. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of writers, you know, write the book and go, okay, now how do I sell it? Um, yeah. Promotion probably starts before that, doesn't it? Yes. You need to plan <laughs> the promotion. And the biggest mistake that authors make is to write the book and assume that people will find it even if they don't promote it. And I got a five-step process, positioning, 
What's the question you answer? Uh, how are you going to get reach? How are you going to uh, get people who like the book to spread it? And how are you going to get the timing focused or right around the book launch? That's PQRST. Uh, those are the five steps that I recommend people do to prepare for promotion in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, and I was, I was somewhat being facetious because I mean, I think a lot of people do realize that they think the hard part's writing the book. Um, you know, but, yeah. uh, you know, what you just outlined in 30 seconds really is an effective way to think about a book plan. Um, like you would have a marketing plan for anything, uh, yeah. um, obviously, but really the best time to start is maybe before you even start writing the book, you know, well, start building that platform. Yeah. Well, people don't realize, but in most book processes, there's a period of, three to six months when the book is in some sort of production and printing process and you as the author don't have too much to do. Yeah. That's exactly when you work on the promotion planning because the temptation is to sort of relax and say, Oh, I'm done. And then the time comes to promote, and you're like, Oh crap, I didn't put anything in place. <laughs> well, I, I tell you during COVID that it was 12 to 18 months for some, for some people to get, <laughs> yes, their, get their books out. And it's like, well, I don't even remember what I wrote. <laughs> you know, how am I going to promote it? <laughs> yeah. Well, Josh, it was uh, great having you stop by the duct tape marketing podcast. Do you want to invite people to connect with you and obviously uh, where they can pick up the book? Okay. So if people want to reach me, you want to go to burnoff.com. That's my website, B-E-R-N-O-F-F.com. I post a blog post there every single weekday, mostly about authors and their issues. And if people are interested in getting the new book, uh, Build a Better Business Book, you can go to burnoff.com slash books, or you can pick that up on Amazon or bookshop.org or wherever you're used to shopping for books. Um, and by the time this goes live, the audio book will be available. It's already available in print and as an ebook. Awesome. Uh, you can tell how long somebody has been online by the fact that they have their last name, uh, .com, um, <laughs> as, as a website. I, I, I bought it from like a third cousin of mine in Chile, <laughs> but that was in, that was a long, long time no, ago. No. So I, I, I actually, when all my kids were born, I actually reserved the names, <laughs> their names, you know, I, I, yeah. I don't know if they've kept them or, or not, but yeah, um, you can tell how long somebody's been online. All right, Josh, again, great uh, uh, having you stop by and hopefully we'll run into you one of these days out there on the road. All right. It's been great to be here and uh, thanks for giving me the chance to speak with your audience. You bet.